Hi, my name's Vince Sheehan, and today I'd like to talk about Shostakovich's Fifth Symphony, and I'd like to go through each of the four movements, looking at how the music in this famous symphony is put together, because I do believe that having some understanding of structure in classical music can greatly aid our appreciation and enjoyment of it. Now Shostakovich's Fifth Symphony, which is surely one of the most famous pieces of the 20th century, uh, is perhaps more than most pieces um, very difficult to disentangle the music from the context in which it was written. In January of 1936, Stalin went to um, a performance of Shostakovich's opera, Lady Macbeth of, M of the Matensk district, and Stalin walked out uh, during the performance. It was clear that he didn't like Shostakovich's opera, and Shostakovich was terrified. And sure enough, a few days later, in Pravda, the Soviet newspaper, in an article entitled Muddle Instead of Music, Shostakovich was savagely torn apart. His reputation was in tatters. He was humiliated, but more seriously, he knew that he was in serious trouble and he was, thin, he was skating on thin ice with the authorities. It was around this time that many of Shostakovich's associates, colleagues in the arts, friends, even family members fell prey to Stalin's purges. And to live under that immense pressure, particularly as a public figure as well, must have been more than he could bear. At the time Shostakovich was writing his fourth symphony, and that was due to be premiered at some point that year, but he um, publicly withdrew it and kept it locked up um, because he knew that that piece would fan um, the hatred of the authorities even more. Shostakovich began work on his fifth symphony in 1937 and he knew that this was his chance to rehabilitate himself, at least for the time being, with the authorities. He completed it in a couple of months, and it was premiered in November of 1937, conducted by Ravinsky, and it was a great success. The uh, officials at the premiere seemed to uh, view it as an acceptable form of Soviet art, there was this struggle inherent in the music with a happy ending. But the public at the performance seemed to discern something of the weight of suffering which Russia had experienced collectively over those terrible years. So Shostakovich managed that rare feat of pleasing two different sets of people and uh, coming out on top. Now, Shostakovich, just before it was premiered, was said to have written that his piece was a Soviet artist's creative response to just criticism. And whether or not Shostakovich actually wrote those words, it says something about the nature of this piece. There's a lot of ambiguity in this symphony. What is Shostakovich really trying to express in this work. How far can we go down the um, Soviet propaganda line? How far can we go down the kind of more subversive reading of this symphony? And we'll perhaps uncover some of those aspects as we go through each of the movements. The first movement is this gigantic sonata form movement, um, brimming full of ideas. And um, it starts with a first subject. The symphony's in D minor, by the way. It starts with a first subject, which in turn has about four motifs in that subject group. The first one is a canon, that is um, a strict imitation of a melodic idea, um, separated by a beat or so. It's kind of an overlapping effect. And uh, the symphony begins in this extremely stark and austere way. There's a 
a sense in that opening music of the stifled atmosphere. There's no breathing space in this music. It speaks something of repression and control. I don't want to um, stretch the Soviet analogy too much of the, the authorities breathing down Shostakovich's neck, but there is that kind of uh, restriction uh, and stress in this music. We then have a second idea in this first subject group, where there is more space, but it's a, a more kind of eerie, unsettling atmosphere. It goes like this. So on. We also have an additional idea um, which goes like this. so on. And finally we have this raising scale idea, first heard on the oboe I think. Each of those four ideas in that first subject group um, will prove to be hugely important in uh, the development and recapitulation and indeed the coda. Eventually we come to the second subject we have this uh, this rocking idea in the accompaniment it goes like this. Then we have this idea with these wide intervals, quite calm. Apparently, recently, um, scholars have uh, worked out that this is a veiled reference, this uh, subject, to um, an unrequited um, love of Shostakovich, um, who refused to marry him, and she went off with another person called Roman Carmen. They lived in Spain. And uh, these wide intervals suggest um, the habanera from Carmen, Bizet's Carmen, I think the bit where she sings, you know, L'Amour. Um, uh, that listens to the original aria, but um, Shostakovich apparently is taking something from that aria and putting it in his music. And I think something of this love affair or this unrequited love comes back later on in the symphony as well. The second subject has another idea as well, it goes like this. Eventually we get to the development, and the development is one of the most thrilling passages in all symphonic music in my opinion, I think it's really marvellous. First of all, the piano is introduced into the um, orchestral texture. We have um, this idea. That motif kind of acts as a, a kind of a factory machine there, uh, driving the music along. And then above that, we have that um, second idea from the first subject group played on very low horns. Mm -hmm. 
And this development just builds and builds and builds. It keeps gathering pace, like a stone rolling down a hill, and uh, gets more and more hectic uh, in tone. And eventually, um, we get to this demented march, uh, which is one of my, my most favourite uh, moments in this symphony, um, where there's like this kind of military band suddenly appears and blazes out that um, descending idea um, with these kind of uh, augmented uh, and diminished intervals. takes us after this uh, kind of this crashing uh, climax to the um, the recapitulation. Now quite often in Shostakovich symphonies the boundaries between where the development ends and the recapitulation begins are often blurred. Um, you might think of the 10th symphony as another example or the 8th symphony. But here I, I strongly uh, believe that it's at this moment when that canonic uh, idea right from the beginning of the symphony comes back in a thrilling way between the strings and the woodwind um, where the note values are um, a lot shorter this time um, and not only is the first idea of the first subject in canon but in the brass we hear those wide-ranging intervals from the second subject in canon as well it's an extremely ingenious way of combining uh, those key themes heard already in this symphony. Eventually we hear that um, third idea in the first subject uh, and the orchestra kind of wails in lament here in a, a kind of monophonic texture uh, like this. hit D minor again. Then we hear the uh, second subject in D major and this is rather marvellous because those wide-ranging Carmen intervals are heard again but in dialogue between um, the solo flutes and solo horn and the horns playing some extremely high notes here. Um, when we hear the second subject the first time round in the exposition, the violas are playing extremely high in their register, which perhaps suggests something of the strain and tension of this music. And here the horn plays these extremely high notes in the recapitulation. We then have a coda, which is rather ghostly and spectral in nature. We have the first subject again in the coda, but this time turned upside down, inverted on the flute. hear those rising scales from the end of the first subject group and the movement ends with these ghostly upward chromatic um, splashes on the celesta. The second movement in contrast is Shostakovich uh, with his black humour and his sardonic wit. Uh, there's a, a Mahlerian roughness about this music. It sounds, it reminds me a bit of Prokofiev as well actually. Um, it's in an ABA ternary form, which you'd expect from a scherzo, and we begin with this idea in the low strings. And then over the top of that we hear this idea which is a variation on there. That's heard on the E flat clarinet, another Mahlerian touch. And then we have this um, idea, this skipping idea. So 
Then the horns come in with another idea in this A section. Then eventually we get to B, the middle section, which is a parody on um, a Lendler, which uh, Mahler specialised in. Shostakovich was greatly influenced by Mahler, of course. We have this idea. section comes back this time the bassoons are to the fore with uh, pizzicato strings and we have a coda based on that middle lendler section. The third movement is the emotional core of this symphony. Um, it said in the premiere people were in tears about um, this um, music particularly in this movement and um, this music so emotional it, it speaks so much of the suffering of the millions of people affected um, in Russia at that time under the tyranny of Stalin. Um, apparently Shostakovich wrote this in three days or so and the music has this organic feel to it as if it's each uh, idea is growing out of the previous one. You can still discern the structure of a rondo in this music though. Um, it's in F sharp minor. We bring, begin with this idea, with the third violins. It goes like this. There's another idea in this A section as well, which has the feel of an Orthodox chant, a, a Russian Orthodox church chant. And um, there's an excellent Discovery Music video where Stephen Johnson, the, the BBC broadcaster on classical music, uh, he, he, he picks this apart and suggests that that's one of the reasons why people were so moved, because they were hearing music um, which was coming close to their um, church liturgy, which of course was brutally suppressed under uh, the Soviet um, leadership. We hear this uh, childlike idea. I think another reference to Tchaikovsky's love life. Um, we have a cadence in B minor which I think sounds very similar to the, the cadences in the introduction to Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet overture. Now this is how it strikes me, I mean um, I'm sure someone's picked this up before but it really does sound very close. So have a listen to that with the harps as well. We then get to a B section where we hear actually a reference to the first subject to the first movement. We hear this idea. We have a return to A where we have this swelling in grief but it doesn't quite um, reach its fulfilment. There's some kind of anti-climax there. We come back to then a new section, C, where we hear the oboe play this motif. underneath 
that we hear. It sounds like um, a lone cry, um, perhaps of the artist himself. Underneath that, we have um, references to the motifs from the A section. Then we come back to um, A again, and we have this overwhelming climax where the, t the, the emotion is reached such a peak that we hear that chant idea again, this time with a uh, xylophone added, and it's um, a really tremendously moving moment in this symphony. We then have um, a, a D section, which is just like a development, really, of the ideas we've heard so far, beginning with that oboe cry. We have another A section, B, and then we have a coda where we hear the harp harmonics and the celesta, and it, the whole movement ends with this beautiful kind of tears to pick a D effect, this um, wonderful, wonderfully rich F sharp major chord, which then recedes into nothingness. Then before we have time to collect our thoughts, we're into the fourth movement, which is perhaps the most controversial movement um, and perhaps the, the, mo the movement which is most open to interpretation in this symphony. Um, clearly some kind of struggle is inherent in this, uh, this movement, like the symphony as a whole perhaps. But, um, and it ends in a jubilant way. But I believe the music sounds rather hollow, and I think that's deliberately so, because although this music would have pleased the Soviet officials at the premiere, Shostakovich, I think, was trying to say something a bit different, which others uh, have suspected as well, of course, before, long before me. Um, it's in an A, B, C, then return to A uh, form, and by the way, if you want to follow the form more closely, perhaps with a score, I've, I've put, them with, put the form with the bar numbers for each movement in the, the, the comments and the description below, so please check that out. The A section begins with a scream, with a crescendo from forte to three Fs, and then we have this idea in the brass. It's a cello rando, and we hear this new idea, which goes like this on the violin. Something like that, anyway. And then that rages on. This is like the, the music of struggle and we and heroism. And then we hear this new idea on the solo trumpet, which then is played by the whole orchestra in this rousing and jubilant way. And so on. That crashes then to this the music then kind of grinds to a halt and we're into the B section in B flat major. And we hear that new melody again on the solo horn. And it's played piano expressivo, complete contrast to how it was just played by the whole orchestra. And here Shostakovich sounds like a, a Hollywood film composer. It's kind of lushly scored and... Um, but he's telling us something uh, very important here because we have another um, climax on the strings of a very kind of rich Tchaikovsky and uh, orchestrated climax and it sounds like another quote from Romeo and Juliet this time um, a version of the famous melody from that overture it goes like this sounds very similar to that famous love theme from the Romeo and Juliet overture by Tchaikovsky. Then um, we hear the rising scale, a rising scale in the flute which calls to mind the first 
uh, subject to the first movement again. And then we go into the C section, where we hear this idea. The violin ostinato. And um, peep scholars have found that this is a reference to a song Shostakovich wrote around about the same time called Rebirth. And uh, this, I believe, think is key into understanding the whole symphony. Um, the words are by Pushkin, and uh, some of the words are these. With the passing of time, the crude door beams of the barbarian will dry and flake off like old scales. The beauty of the original painting will be visible once more. So Shostakovich here is in his own coded way, and Shostakovich, of course, is the master of musical codes, is suggesting that all isn't what it seems in this symphony look below the superficial level and I think that's the key to enjoying this symphony. We then get back to the A section but this time it's pianissimo, it's a lot slower. We hear the timpani and the side drum beating out this military tattoo. It sounds like the, the, the army, the revolutionary army is at the gates. Victory is surely on its way and we keep hearing that Da, 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 that idea from the beginning of the movement, um, but in lots, uh, much longer notes in augmentation. We have this dominant pedal in D minor. Then eventually the music erupts into the coda, and we have that optimistic and grandiose closing to this symphony, which perhaps sounds rather empty and hollow too. Now, famously in this coda, the violins play repeated A's for pages and pages. And it's been suggested that those A's might be Shostakovich calling out because the note A um, in Russian, I believe, um, can mean me, the word me. And um, it's apparently Shostakovich screaming out, me, 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 asserting his identity through the bombast of this Soviet um, propaganda. Um, and that kind of rings true to me, because if you think of the Tenth Symphony as well, for instance, where he asserts his name at the end of that work through his signature, I think it's something Shostakovich was very keen to do, and he knew that perhaps the censors wouldn't pick up on it. Um, a note on the final bars of this symphony, there's no ritardando marked in the score, there's no slowing down at the end, and almost every performance I've heard of this, the conductor slows down right at the end. And to me, that suggests the conductor is perhaps not appreciating um, Shostakovich's submersive, subversive message in this movement. Um, I think the music has to career on beyond the final bars so that the machine is unstoppable, this terrible machine of pain and suffering, this, um, this uh, tyranny uh, will carry on. And um, I think when conductors slow down at the end for the grand finale as such, I think it spoils the effect somewhat. I remember playing this in an orchestra, a youth orchestra, and the conductor, Peter Stark, insisted that we carried on at that speed right to the end, no slowing down, and I think that was, the right, that was the right decision. I've heard very few recordings where that has happened. Please tell me if you know of any. So that's Shostakovich's Fifth Symphony, a remarkable work which seems to be able to be read on different levels. And what do you think about this work? Do you think it should be viewed more in the... Uh, the Soviet kind of ideological uh, view, um, full of hubris and bombast, um, full of the glory of uh, communism, or do you think it has a more personal message within it? I'd like to hear your views. And please, if you like, if you've enjoyed this video, click and subscribe. And if you have any suggestions for other pieces you'd like me to analyse, please put them in the comments below.
Thank you very much.